Welcome to the Backstage Creative. My name is Krista Copper. On this podcast, I interview people who work behind the scenes of theater to create all of the wonderful theater magic. People who design the sets, costumes, lights, people who run the soundboard in the back and stage manage, uh, people who choreograph and um, direct, who play instruments or music direct. There are so, so many people uh, involved in theater. Uh, It takes so many different skill sets and personalities and uh, artistic visions and and creativity to get a show on stage. And I have just been having so much fun sitting down with some of these people and listening to their stories, hearing their wisdom, asking them big questions. I just, it's, it's been such a great learning experience for me. And I hope that whether this is your first episode or you've listened to all the interviews that you can, your life has also benefited from the conversations that I have with these folks. Today's my conversation with Ana Maria Abuerto. Ana is a painter, New York City-based painter, and Ana works a lot in television and in theater, and so it was fun to talk to her and and to hear more about television world and how, how it's different from theater world. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy this conversation, so let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Ana Maria Abuerto. Um, what have you been working on lately? Are you are you doing any projects currently? Yeah, I actually got back to work finally because um, we I, I was working for a TV show at the moment, and it, the season ended, so we had a month long break, and now back back to season three now. So back to work. Yeah, what TV show is that? It's um, FBI's Most Wanted. It's a it's a Dick Wolf show, you know. Lots of cop stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and do you like what do you what is your role on the on those on that show? Oh, I'm I'm a scenic, so I will just be a painter and uh, love uh, creating some jail cells and uh, some grimy houses or some really fancy finishes. You know, and then I got to paint a drop today. I mean, this week um, that was really lovely. I haven't painted a drop in a while. How does TV differ from working in theater? It's very different. Uh, the The pace of it is so much faster. Like when you work in a in a, in a show for theater, you have um, all of this time to work on creating one set that will together like that will live together for the duration of the show, right? And uh, when you work in TV, it's like, okay, we need this to change now, and it has to be done by this day and then we have to take it back and put it paint it back to what it was the next day because we got to give it back to the people that we borrowed it from or sometimes like a set we'll build a set and we'll have like a week to paint it and then the next week we have to repaint it to be something else so there's this like in theater everything's like built to be the like star right like the set of the of the show is like part of the star of the show and in the in tv it just kind of is like a I don't know. It's like in, in the background. You don't really pay attention to the set in the TV show, at least not in this one. So I guess the difference will be like how permanent things are and how important they are to like further the story. Do you ever think like, oh man, I just painted that. Now I have to paint over it. <laughs> I do. Yeah. A lot of the times, especially because sometimes I'll be like, okay, so this set has to be really old and really grimy and you make it look like so cool and grimy and then they're like okay so now it's a new apartment and you have to like patch over all the ugly things you did and like redo everything from scratch sometimes but it is always it's always really fun to watch things change and like watching how a set designer will adapt the set to be something new every time like they'll you know like we'll have like a jail cell and then the next episode it has to be a different jail cell so they'll add a wall here put a window there or take away that window or it's just, it's fun to watch the puzzle piece, but come together. Mm-hmm. If Think about like the, the, your favorite set designers that you've worked with. What mm-hmm. have been some of the characteristics of uh, the set designers that make you just really excited to work with them? Uh, there's a lot of really cool, like attention to detail. So like if the set designer really wants something to, there's like uh, light in the back, you know, it has, if it's a set that is new um, there's small details that bring it to life, but when it's an old thing, you have a lot of history and then you can like put a lot of 
yeah, just like story behind it. Like uh, uh, I like to call it sometimes method painting where you're just like walking around and like kicking things. You're like, this is where I would kick something or like, oh, I'd slam the door over here. And so you put a little dash of paint over there or like key marks from like whenever you're trying to open your door and you don't know where the door is like that, those little details like when a designer really wants those like that's really that's really cool yeah are you um so i'm a musician and so i don't i don't you know know all the ins and outs of like painting and scene wor- scenic world but do you do you get a lot of liberty with the paint work that you do or is it pretty i don't want to say like paint by number but like pretty pretty specific what you're handed no, I actually think it's it's less specific than when you do theater. For TV, I think that um, the set designer will be like, okay, well, this wall has to be white dove and it has to look old. But like, they don't tell you exactly where you have to put all of the of the aging or like, they, they, they kind of let you, they trust you and they let you do it. Um, and not that the theater designers don't, but like when a theater designer comes in with a rendering, right? Like you get that picture of like what it's supposed to be and it's a little bit more specific and planned out and it's gone through several revisions. And um, just the fact that you get the piece of paper that says like, this is supposed to look um, a certain way. I, I feel like you get more direction from a theater designer and also because it's gonna be more permanent and because it's gonna be there the whole time for people to see in focus as opposed to when you're in TV and it's like in the background and like you're really paying attention to the characters and not necessarily how old the apartment looks right um yeah so not a lot of liberty i guess in painting yeah um do you have a preference tv or theater i really like theater because you get to see the whole thing come together you get to like i the, the process of like starting from like when it's just luan to like seeing it on stage like that's really satisfying whereas in tv sometimes you're like jumping a project and they're like okay well today you can do some seams and then tomorrow you're going to be doing a ceiling at somewhere else. Um, so you don't really get to see that like full arc of the set and you don't get to like, uh, like baby it a little bit and like give it all the uh, love and care you want to give it in, in theater. I feel like uh, watching it come together and like when you get to that final step where you're like adding the small details, like it really brings it to life. And, and sometimes you don't get to do that in, in television because you get put on so many projects because it's so fast. It's the difference. I've talked to other people who also work in both worlds, TV and and theater. And I think it it just makes me laugh when when people say TV is so much more fast paced because I feel like theater is just like, whoa, (laughs) but I I can't imagine a pace faster than theater. But I guess, yeah, TV is. (laughs) Well, I guess, I mean, I think about like my whenever I work for a theater shop, their their shop days are like seven hours. Right. So you got seven hours to work on a set and in TV it's 10 hour days. So like right off the bat, you just spend more time, more hours, but less days in something. Whereas in theater, like you may have like a quick turnaround, but you'll still have short days. So it feels like, I don't know, like it it gets a little stretched out sometimes. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I would love to hear your background, where you're from, if you went to school somewhere and um, how you got to, to the point that you are today. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm originally from Mexico City. Um, then I um, lived in Oaxaca for some time uh, in the south of Mexico. And then <laughs> when I was 13, my parents were like, how about we move to America? I was like, that's exciting. Very cool. Where? And they're like, Minnesota. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we ended up in Minnesota <laughs> when I was 13. That was quite some culture shock. I mean, the weather alone, like it was 60 degrees and I was wearing a parka. And <laughs> I remember people like... Oh, pointing and laughing at me and I'm like yeah well I'll try living in a place where it's 100 degrees all the time so <laughs> um but it was really cool I um I, I think I started to like live my dream because I had grown up with so much like American television that I was like I'm actually living in America this is cool and then I moved to Texas my senior year of high school and that's when I really started to do theater I was doing theater in Minnesota to like make friends and stuff and I was enjoying it and then when I moved to Texas I I found the world of competitive theater <laughs> and um, they were uh, really intense like the um, there were competitions there were like the schools had rivalries for theater and it wasn't a thing that I had been exposed to before but it really put me on a track to like do theater more um, consistently and like like putting 
a lot more attention into it because you know you're in school you're like doing extracurriculars but like theater was like it, it felt like you know when like people do sports and it kind of takes over like that's kind of what it felt like it was like if you're doing theater it's going to take over your life so that put me on track to look at universities for for theater and i ended up at a conservatory in st louis where all we did was theater so it felt like i was uh back home uh in texas and just doing it every day it was theater theater classes theater um homework <laughs> theater projects like doing we would get assigned to shows and so we'd have different roles in the show and so you go to class and then go to crew right so like you'd have to like do props or do painting and that's how i became involved in theater um and it, it was four years of really intense <laughs> uh training for for theater and every summer we'd all go out and work somewhere for a summer stock or like a big internship or something like that so i did those every summer for painting and i was studying set design but i was painting in the in those summers and it was always really fun always a lot of um really great opportunities in the summer i did a summer at the oregon shakespeare festival and i feel like that's when like my life changed i was like this is amazing everybody there was uh so encouraging and i was really young to have into the internship but i like people encouraged me to pursue painting outside of design and I think that's when I when I graduated, I decided to pursue painting as opposed to design because it was it it felt more fulfilling to me. And so I applied for an internship in New Jersey uh, right after I graduated and I ended up moving to New York and painting. I was working for a backdrop, um, a, a company that specialized in backdrops and they we would paint backdrops all the time. And uh, it became this like excellent gateway for me to like enter the New York City freelancing scene. And I was, uh, then I met people who helped me get more opportunities like in, in more off Broadway theaters and then some union work here and there. And then I finally decided I was like, I'm gonna join the union. And cause the scenic union is, um, it's pretty big in New York City. It gets a lot of really great opportunities. And um, obviously like <laughs> having benefits is lovely. <laughs> so I joined the union and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so there was a little bit of a hiccup. But after uh, everybody started getting back to work, I've just been I've just been able to to work in television. And I love it. I love painting. <laughs> what do you love about painting? I like that it is I, I know it doesn't look glamorous, but it feels really glamorous to me. <laughs> Where I like covered in paint and I just like walk around making things look old or new or fake you know um i feel like a small magician now and then <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair um how do you think how do you think growing up in mexico influences the, your art more than it influences my art it influences my attitude towards things so i like when we moved to minnesota i remember my dad was like he would try to do just about every job possible. And I never watched my dad complain about any job, even if it was a bad job. So it really built my, um, it helped me realize that like work is important and that you have to really like, it's good that you like what you do. And therefore um, I just like become more invested in when, what I'm doing uh, when I do it. I don't know, it changed my work ethic. And that's what it was. It was nice to like have the example of someone who did a lot of work and did it for themselves and their family and uh, watching that has like oh, always really inspires me to think about like the way that my parents were adapting to living in america and i feel like i'm kind of paying it forward to them by doing the same thing for myself helping them whenever i can i think that it's more about like work ethic than it was about like my artistic vision mm -hmm. yeah sure what part of minnesota did you live in I lived in Bloomington, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I lived in, do you know Roseville? I don't know Roseville. Was that north? Um, it's a suburb of St. Paul. It's, yeah, north oh. of St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I lived there for two years, but the cold, I couldn't take it, so I moved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, sometimes I wish I could go back. If there was more work, I would move to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they have a good art scene. It's just, yeah, it's a, kind of a difficult scene to get in and you have to deal with the winter but I, the people who live there and are making a living doing it I really enjoy it but yeah yeah 
I imagine as a as a painter, like sometimes you're like physically in kind of awkward positions for a long time, like kind of like bending over and kneeling and um, like stooping. How, do you do anything to keep your body healthy so that you can, you know, paint and, you know, be on the floor and all that stuff? Uh, I really should be doing a lot more. I know a lot of painters who do lots of yoga. I know painters who do some physical therapy for <laughs> Our, our, our exercises from physical therapy to like help strengthen uh, the muscles that we use a lot, like our forearms or like our wrists. But I don't personally do as much as I should. I really should be doing more. I do a lot of walking and I do some running. So like, I guess like there is some <laughs> ability to stay uh, active, but I feel like it is a lot more about stretching and ex- uh, like strengthening the muscles that you use the most. Mm-hmm. Have you found any ways to kind of um, like use your body more efficiently when you're painting? Well, there are a lot of tools that are helpful um, and you have to, I mean, sometimes it sounds like really obvious to like use a roller pole when you're painting, but like sometimes like you need to like consider, like when we were painting this rock this week, I watched one of my coworkers like kneeling and like painting, like bending over and painting. I was like, we should should probably use a stick and it'll help your back. It'll help you feel more rested after this because you're putting on less effort um so it's just a matter of like remembering like what tools exist to make the job less strenuous on your on your body like doing ceilings you know like there's not a lot you can do when you're patching a ceiling but try to like take some breaks and stretch a little bit in between um but when you can use the shortcuts like a stick or like a roller pole you should try to do that. Even like wrist guards. Sometimes uh, people come in with wrist guards, even though they don't necessarily have like a wrist injury, but it just helps keep your 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 wrist straight and and avoid any injury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes it can be easy to forget like what tools are available to you till you have like really bad back pain or carpal tunnel and yeah. Yeah, you don't want to get there. You want to prevent it. <laughs> mm-hmm. In your world, how, how are you getting jobs? Is it word of mouth? Are you applying for things? Are people recommending you? How does how does paint world work in terms of finding work? It's a combination of things. Sometimes I, sometimes I reach out to people and that's how I get work. Uh, other times I do get suggested for jobs or I will have had my name on a list somewhere and they'll reach out and offer a position or like offer to apply for a position. But I think it's mostly like word of mouth and, and um, haven't done a good job to with someone and then they will recommend you or put in a good word for you when you apply somewhere else. A little bit about who you know. Mm-hmm. So how, what have you learned about like freelancing and building a, building a network? I have learned that you should always be uh, at, on your best behavior, obviously, but do your best work and be a nice person. Like people don't want to hire someone who's really good, but um, is really terrible to be around. Work environment has become really important, right? And I don't think it's ever not been important, but when you want to have a good team, you want to get people to get along and also do a good job. So, and, and, and also understanding like where your weaknesses are and asking for help. When you need help, don't try to like do it on your own. Like if you ask for help, then you're allowing, you're, you're, I mean, you kind of like show vulnerability, but it also shows that you're human and you're not trying to like mess things up on purpose or um, try to like pretend like you know more than you do, uh, which is, I don't think it's a good look. Yeah, just like doing a good job, being a nice person, being humble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be so tempting to like put up put on a good face and, um, you know, pretend that you know everything that's going on and you don't make mistakes. But I, yeah, I think that's just asking for a mistake to happen. (laughs) Yeah. And when you're really young or like when you're starting out, you also like, you can't pretend like, you know, everything and, um, asking questions. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking questions. Depends on the news. Sometimes people don't answer questions well, but you should always ask questions if you have them because it's better to be prepared for something than to like do it and then realize that you did it wrong or like it can't be undone, things like that. Yeah. How do you grow? How do you get better at what you do? Um, I've been taking some classes now and then, like painting classes just to help understand the medium better. And even when it's in a small scale and it's not necessarily like the same 
techniques, but like it just helps you understand the the concept of paint better and colors, um, color theory, form, all those things that sometimes like you don't use every day at work, but having that knowledge helps you make good decisions when you're doing stuff at work. Um, also asking questions and like talking to people who've been doing this a long time, like they will help you so much. Uh, you just need to ask the questions, like ask for the experience. Uh, sometimes like we'll, at work, they'll like do this treatment. I'm like, well, I've never done this treatment before. Like, how do you do it? And you learn a little bit. You maybe like take some mental, mental notes or maybe you write it down. That Then you have that in your back pocket for whenever you get to use that information. One of the great things about like being a freelancer and working in different theaters and with different people, I think, is that you get a, if you take advantage of it, there's like a, a whole world of knowledge and wisdom that you can learn from if you take a little bit of initiative. Yeah, and even with that initiative, you just um, you can ask for feedback too. You know, you could be like, "Hey, I know this was my first week on the job. Like, I just want to know what do you think I did well, or like where I have more room to grow. I felt like this was a fear. You know, you just be like, have to be transparent. Some people will not straight up tell you that you did something wrong, but if you ask, maybe they're willing to give you um, good feedback so you can take that into consideration for the next time you do the same job or when you work with somebody else. Mm-hmm. For sure. If you had to pick three of the top skills needed for your job, what would they be? You need to be a good team player. I think that's number one. When you work in a team of, of people, you work with a lot of personalities. Um, you have to be able to like take instruction well or be able to ask questions. So I feel like being aware of these social situations helps you make better decisions when you're painting or like the way you're painting. But as far as like skills go, you have to understand color mixing. Uh, you have to understand a little bit of construction, uh, the way that like things are built, the way that like things are supposed to look, just like a willingness to be told how to do things, you know, to like take instruction well so that, well, because sometimes I don't know, like you don't just like go to school and learn how to age a wall, right? Like it's, I don't, <laughs> uh, I, they don't teach you necessarily like, how to patch a ceiling. But those are things you do every day and, and just like a willingness to learn and like get better at doing things that are simple, but like have to be done well and fast. Maybe speed, you know, definitely some time management. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would say definitely some uh, painting knowledge, some good people skills and time management. Yeah. I think anybody can do this job. I think you can be really good if you have a good eye for it. Uh, and I think it's about like how much you like doing it that will get you to be better and like really enjoy it. Do you think um, having a good eye is something that's uh, kind of like natural and innate in some people? Or do you think it's something that is learned? I think that sometimes it's a natural thing. I think you can teach people to look for specific examples but like for example we were painting this drop this week and we were given just a photograph and um we had to kind of make it up as we, we had like two days to paint this like 46 foot long drop we didn't really have a designer coming in and giving us feedback or anything like that so we kind of had to like look at it and be like well does this look good or does this not look good and when it comes to like stuff like foliage and and, and like things that are far away or like you need to squint to look at if you don't know what it's supposed to look like, then you have to have a good intuition to say, yeah, this is good, or this needs more work. If you're trying to teach this to someone, it, it's kind of hard to say like, oh, well, the example, this is always how it looks good, and this is how it always like needs more work. Um, there's some things that are very like, depends on like your, your um, perspective. There's some technical things that you can teach people that are right, but the perspective, when it comes to perspective things, I think you have to have a good eye for it. You have to be like, have it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any like favorite um, materials to work with? Like a favorite type of paint, a favorite type of material to paint that when you see that you get to do that thing, you're like, oh yes, I get to work with wood or metal. The number of concrete things that I've had to make in my life has been astounding. I never thought I would be making so much faux concrete, uh, <laughs> but it always brings such joy to me. Um, lately, when it comes to TV, we do like actual like concrete, like stone, right? Or like uh, like a powder mix that you put water in and some 
tints and stuff, and then you apply it with a trowel. You 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 make it look like concrete because it is concrete, but and it always looks really cool. And you could do add you could add more parts to the process, but whenever it comes to like painting fake concrete, I think it's always really fun. It's my favorite thing to do. You do like I, I love adding glazes to things. So when you do like the concrete with the paint and you add glazes and layers and spatters, oh, I love doing that. Why why do you love to do that? It is so satisfying to watch a piece of wood go through so many steps to become concrete. <laughs> and uh, it always looks uh, uh, pretty realistic and people like the finish and the way that people have been using the finish. I mean, so a lot of like fashion shows will like to use it. Uh, there was one time that I did it for a, an installation for a museum and it had to be this concrete overpass. And it just, it always just looks so cool and industrial. Uh, it always gets put in, in cool places, I think. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, this is kind of a similar question, but do you have like a favorite, a favorite type of project to work on or a favorite story to help tell? I don't think I have a preferred one. Um, I like new shows a lot um, because this is kind of like the first time they're doing it. This is like the first trial and we're going to see what works, what doesn't work. But then you at least get to like bring a world to life for the first time. So that's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to work on new stuff too. I think there's, you're not as burdened with like tradition <laughs> as yeah, exactly. with the new work. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you don't do a streaker named desire, right? And you're like, Oh, it always has to look like this. Uh, there isn't like a, like a preconceived idea of what it should be. You get to like make a new thing. And for the first time, this is the first time it comes to life and you get to decide and have some more freedom of what it could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love to do that too. I'll assume that there's been some, some failure in your career. Like I think we all go through, how do you, mm-hmm. how, what have you learned about kind of navigating failure or even if even if it like wasn't a failure like you felt like you failed or didn't do the job well how do you how do you navigate those those experiences it's really difficult to navigate experiences like that when you're an artist right because sometimes it feels like you as an artist aren't good enough or like there was something wrong with uh the way that you saw things or um the way that you managed it so it becomes this like big struggle and like it really intertwines itself with your life I mean, I'll give you an example. I, uh, when I first took my union test, I, uh, I didn't pass and I had to like think about it. I was like, Oh my God, like, what did I do wrong? Like, did I answer these questions incorrectly? Like, was it about like my stuff not being good enough? All I could do was go back and ask for more feedback. I went uh, to like old mentors and, uh, old coworkers and I asked them to look at my stuff and I was like, what do you think could have been better about this? And like, what would you have done to like change this? And I just asked the questions so that I could, when I did it again, I was better prepared and I felt more confident in what I had, like what my shortcomings had been. I knew those, I identified them. And then I was able to like push myself to get over those and and make progress on myself. And I feel like that's how it is in most failures. You just have to like look back, analyze, and then, Ultimately, you just got to move forward and and know that you're going to try to be better the next time. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to take the, your identity out of it a little bit in order to yeah. to learn and move on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and, and try to like not take it personal. I know it always is so easy to be like, oh, well, I'm an artist. Like, it's definitely about me, but it it didn't have to be. And if you take yourself out of it, then it's going to be a lot easier to reconcile with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I agree with that. Awesome. So I, I do have one final question that I like to ask everyone, and that is, what are you excited about right now? I am very excited to get back to work because I like having purpose to my life, uh, and not that work is purpose, but it makes me like look forward to the next day. I like my job so much that I just get to, you know, I'm really lucky to get to do it every day and get a variety of things, uh, more experience. As a young artist, I think that I'm really excited to like develop my career and see where the next thing is and like how to get better. And I watch my coworkers have been doing this for many, many years and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to be that good. (laughs) Um, So doing it every day definitely helps me 
get there slowly. But you know, I'll be there. The music for the Backstage Creative was improvised and performed by Ian Leroy, and the logo was designed by Carly Wagner.